In this episode, you'll learn how agencies can work better with institutions to build service design capacity. What is the future role of agencies when everything goes in-house? And finally, where and how can Frontline contribute in designing services? And here is the guest for this episode. Hi, I'm Sarah Drummond, and this is The Service Design Show. Hey, my name is Mark Fontijn, and this is The Service Design Show. If you want to create more impact as a service design and change the world for the better, then you've come to the right place. Because on this show, you'll get the chance to learn from the success of some of the world's best service designers. We talk about topics ranging from design thinking, customer experience, organizational change, and creative leadership. If these are the topics you're interested in, be sure to know that we bring in a new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, subscribe to the channel. My guest in this episode is Sarah Drummond. Sarah is the managing director of a design and strategy agency called We Are Snook, which she co-founded back in 2009 with Lauren Kirby, who was also a guest on the show. So for the next 30 minutes, Sarah will be talking about how agencies can work better with institutions to build service design capacity. What is the future role of agencies when everything goes in house? And finally, where and how can Frontline contribute in designing services? So that was it for the introduction. And now let's jump straight into the interview with Sarah. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi, Mark. It's, uh, it's so good to have you here because we had the other co-founder of We Are Snook, I think in the second or third episode on the show. And now we have the other co-founder of Snook. So uh, happy to have you again, Sarah. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Mark. Um, the question that I ask everybody on the show, the first question is, do you actually remember the very first time uh, you met service design? That's such a historical question for me. Yes, um, it's probably nearly 10 years ago now, I think. And I was studying product design, actually. So I met it as a student. And I met it in a way that I didn't actually know what it was. So I come from a background of designing lampshades, coat hangers, bicycle stands, <laughs> drawing, everything. Um, and we were asked when we were at the Glasgow School of Art to come and look at a a public body that sits under Scottish government's remit and asked to look at how their business was performing. And we, we went about it in the same way any designer would, that you'd create a chair or a coat hanger. Um, we interviewed <laughs> people, we tried to understand their experience, um, we used a lot of uh, visual language to map how the whole business worked. Uh, we prototyped and tested new concepts, they happened to be services. Um, and we presented it back to the government and it was only really during that process of, of some extra teaching that someone said this is what service design is and mm. so from then I was hooked and ended up mm. working with them actually over a course of about two years so the, that, that's my first experience. There was a spark or the uh, epiphany, the enlightenment, moment of enlightenment. <laughs> yeah I think it was, it, was, it was really interesting to be a group of product designers traditionally trained at making physical things to come across a new form of material, which mm. is people and relationships mm. and Interactions, politics. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm. Cool. Sarah, uh, you gave me some really interesting topics that we're going to discuss in the next 25 minutes. And I gave you some question starters and we'll co-create uh, the topics and the questions as we go along, right? Are you ready? I am so ready. <laughs> All right, let's start with topic number one. And I know uh, you've been thinking a lot about this one, so this, this should be easy for you. Topic number one is building capacity for service design. Which question starter do you have? So I am going with this one is how can we build capacity for service design? So this is really big for me. And the reason is that before I started Snook um, Florin, I've been working for uh, a non-departmental public body that, that is with Scottish Government that I, I previously mentioned. And it was really difficult with different agencies coming in, uh, doing the work with us, that they would leave and we wouldn't really quite know what to do. And the agencies that did do it really well were some really great service design organisations. Um, they left us with 
I think, some capacity to be able to take on their work and their knowledge. But most of the time, and the work I've seen when I've worked with other agencies now is SNOOC, they haven't been given the capabilities to continuously design great services. Mm. In fact, they've been left uh, in the dark with the agency or organization coming in as an expert. Mm. So I've really been propelled the whole time to think about with SNOOC and with, with any other work in the industry that really we should be thinking about building the capacity for these organizations. Um, and what I mean by that is thinking about how you get people to understand the concept of, of design to begin with, and not even design as service particularly, or design as product or interaction, but understanding that design, for me anyway, is about making sure that the form follows the function. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's about usability. So the first thing really about building capacity is that quite simple understanding. And then at a se second level, it's about really thinking about, in, in a service design context, well, what does service mean for us? So building the capacity of a consistent language um, and understanding of, of that. And then really kind of thirdly is then having the skills and the sustainability strategy really to make that a reality. So training in design skills. Um, so that you, and it's not about everyone becoming a designer for me. It's really about giving everyone the capacity to be able to design. Um, moving people from not just, they don't have to become design experts, but from design basics into design fluency. Mm. Um, and then making sure that you design ways in which the organization can create the products that allow design to be scaled and sustained. So that's, that's what I mean. And I think it's a really big question for me of the industry now, actually, that works in service design to be focusing in on this, um, this question. So, a uh, super uh, relevant topic at this moment and so many questions that go through my head now that you're talking about this. And one of the questions is, for instance, we encounter this a lot in our own projects too. And then the question becomes, but yeah, you're saying uh, we should make everyone understand design, we should uh, make everyone understand services, but is it really everyone or have you found that um, there are uh, different groups of people within an organizations that are more open to it and are more important to actually train or yeah definitely I, I think I can answer that in about three different ways it depends on the stage of design maturity I think of an organization and also I think that aligns really relevantly now with their digital maturity as well um, because services are so often um, are pretty much centered around the digital capacity and thinking of an organization, whether that's how they deliver their services to how they run them in the back end. So one of the things I say first, and it's a bit of a hack really if you're introducing design to an organization, is to go and find the team or department within that organization that can deliver the thing you're going to design. So for example, um, most recently we just worked with Cork County Council that we, we presented with at the Service Design Network Conference. Madrid and it was a wonderful presentation because I felt really proud that they knew exactly what they're talking about they're mm, designing mm. and delivering really good services and when we met Cork they actually had a lot of senior buy-in but we worked with them to look at this new customer transformation team uh, that had people who were actually building the digital front end of new services so they were going through a, a process of digital transformation taking uh, processes that were offline and making them online and we had a bit of an issue and we've laughed about it now that it was originally a lift and shift attitude which was take something that might not be that great offline and just put it online and it might still not be that great and for me the training of those guys was so instrumental to this work because it meant that when we went through the user research and the structuring of what the service should be and the prototyping of it they were able to make it live at the prototyping stage and then take it into a proper live mm. later on. Mm. So in the first instance, who should we train? I think for me, it's the people who have the ability to ship the product. Exactly, to execute. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Right. Yeah. 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 Mm. Or else you end up with uh, a bunch of knowledge that's maybe really interesting, but isn't acted upon within the organization. But, but then I think to that extent, you also need at an early stage and throughout is a senior buy-in. And I, I think that that won't be new to the show or any particular insight, but that, that senior buy-in needs to be brought along across the whole journey. Mm -hmm. And particularly what we're finding, quite difficult actually, 
is to help senior leaders, once they've had their first excitement about it, they, they tend to think about the beginning of this work, is then to make the right and significant investment at a later stage to think about sustaining and growing those capabilities. Because, because it's, e it's easy to do it's easy to do a one-off service design project, but it's really hard to keep it going, right? Yeah, to keep it going, and but to also see that you have to invest behind the the actual design of the service in the products that make the community of people within an organization come together around design. And that's lots of things. So that's uh, things like show and tells, uh, networks of people interested in design coming together. It's platforms and how you analyze the data of how your services are performing, uh, the investment into those kind of products. So it's, it's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that is difficult to sometimes put an exact number on the efficiency it might create or the impact it might have on the end user. So, well, What is your biggest question related to building capacity? What, what, what would you like to, we're uh, doing this episode in December of 2017, what would you like to better understand in 2018? So for me, regarding what, this I'm, topic? Yeah, what I'm really interested in now is the different models in which organizations are using to embed design, mm. not necessarily the process that they're going on, but how those organizations are structured. So for, you know, for example, I've met organizations who have put design completely into their front line, uh, have put it into delivery mechanisms and product management roles. Uh, some of it is in corporate service roles. Um, and I don't think there's any definitive answer at all. It's what works works for each organization. But I'm just interested to know from different people how it's being used and structured within an organization. Hmm, super interesting. We should do a special episode on that. Um, we're going to move on to topic number two. Uh, and that's a really, really important topic uh, because it's uh, about us and about our future. And you formulated this topic as our future role. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go lucky dip on my questions here, but let's <laughs> see how this works out. I think it says how far. So how far can our future role go um, in service design? And I brought this topic up because I regularly have an existential crisis about running an organization. <laughs> and there is a consultancy format. And I am in no doubt, and please come to me if you want any therapy, if you also <laughs> run a consultancy, um, that there are others out there who probably feel the same. <laughs> exactly, Mark. So why, why an existential crisis? So, for me, because I started briefly on the inside, I saw the value of having design on the inside of organizations. And we built Snook around building capacity, right? What we were talking about in the first instance, really trying to make sure that goes inside organizations. Existential crisis is because I really believe that, yet I run an organization that sells consultancy as an expert role to, to companies. Mm -hmm. So now I'm starting, what we've pivoted our work around is, is, is that thought. What I'm then starting to question, and I think other agency leaders might be uh, concerned about, is what happens when everyone goes in-house? What happens when organizations no longer want to pay for you know, consultancy roles? And how far can we take this service design thing um, before we all realize that ultimately it's better in-house, or mm -hmm. is it? <laughs> so, what are, yeah, yeah what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> So my thoughts are that um, I think there will always be a role for consultancies and part of our job is about doing the next thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So right now, what we should be switching on to is making sure that no more massive PowerPoint slide decks are produced, um, that we really craft our practice around the building capacity of organizations. Um, I think there's a huge role in training. I mean, there is a, we know from, you know, major speakers across government anyway, there's a there's a deficit actually in the design talent that is ready to take on these service design roles, mm, to take yeah. on roles around interaction and, and more widely the user experience of, of service, of, of users really, for, for, for the services that government and public sector deliver. So for me, it's a call to arms in the now to organizations to really help those organizations build those capabilities and to be perhaps, and this is not a concern that I think anyone is right now, but to be quite humble actually about what we can do. So to remove ourselves from, you know, expert role into the, the training and the, the skilling up of people to understand and be able to use design is, is you know, something that, that is for good user experience. Mm. And then I think our role in the future is about getting smarter about what we do. So 
can we be designing the tools of tomorrow that allow others in the organization to be able to design? So you've seen certain consultancies, I think, normally recently released a product around being able to design better, I think it was better interfaces. Um, we see companies uh, building things like, you know, their own products like WeTransfer. Now, I'm not saying that's, you know, specific for service design, but I think we can be designing tools now that help do the job better. Um, we've seen this with people like Mark Sickdorn and the work they do at Smatley. So uh, we can be getting smarter now actually about helping organisations have the right tools in place by building them for them. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't think we'll be, we'll be lost, really. <laughs> yeah, our, our, our work is probably going to shift, right? That's, that's, what going to, that's what I'm seeing happening already within, uh, well, I think over the last three to four years that, you know, it's, it's starting to shift from actually doing, getting projects uh, to doing projects while you're really learning uh, and helping the organization to grow and to make yourself obsolete in some way, right? Yeah, I mean, my joke is that we creep away around the back door. We sort of <laughs> uh, start off quite big and quite instrumental in their strategy and the, mm. the initial training and projects. But mm. ultimately, that humbleness around creeping away um, to not be utilized anymore, I think, that's, I think that is an immensely important mindset for, for consultancies going it, forward. Yeah, and if we manage to actually achieve that, we should be really proud of ourselves because it would mean that everybody is, has adopted a design mindset, right? I think so, yeah. But I think what's interesting, though, again, about this, this concept of redundancy that can scare people in terms of a, an agency construct mm. is that there are new problems and new challenges of tomorrow. And I think what consultancies need to be able to do is to be able to pivot and move into those new spaces. So we should be exploring those now on behalf of our clients who are just at the start. Mm. You've got fantastic organizations like um, Projects by If dot everyone who are looking at the, you know, the future of the internet, our user rights, data, how information and data is handled. And mm. that's sometimes a, that's a secondary thing to organizations going on this new you know, journey of design. So we can be crafting the knowledge in that space on behalf of our you know, future clients and helping them with, with that side when it comes to designing you know, in the future really quite complex uh, services. I, I think um, I think you're absolutely right, and at the same time, I also see that there's still so much work to do. You know, there are so many organizations, especially the the smaller the SME organizations, who haven't touched upon the idea of service design yet. That we still have a lot of work to do in that uh, that space. We we won't be out of a job that soon, <laughs> at least not yeah. from my perspective. And I think what you said is vitally important is not to forget that. I, I actually have to remind myself sometimes because I, I like to run away with what's the next big thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. What should, where should we be going? And that, that's my job, right? That's my job at Snook anyways, to be trying to take us in the right direction. But I meet so many people on a daily basis who are really at the start of their journey. And so we have to remember that, <clears throat> that there's a lot of work to be, be done. And I, I think for me, I said this at the SDN conference, but... You know, working with guys like Cork County Council shows the yeah. absolute need, particularly in the local government space, for this, um, yeah. which actually has the ability, in, in a UK construct anyway, to make some of the changes happen that we yeah. can't currently make at the government level because of uh, certain political things going on right now. So, um, yeah, I think there's a huge amount of work to be done and, and, and be shared amongst uh, everyone. You already touched upon uh, the third topic a little bit, uh, so let's move in into this one. And I think you mentioned it in the first topic because it was how can that design can be embedded in uh, frontline. And this third topic is called frontline and system change. Which well, let's go lucky. We're lucky yeah. dipping again. Okay, what <laughs> if? What if? Okay, what if? What if front? Okay, let's reword that. What if frontline staff were in charge of changing the system. What does that mean? Um, I'm hugely fascinated by this topic, again, mostly because of my background in having the very early start in my career of working with frontline careers advisors, um, skill development officers, uh, people working right at the front line. So it's a real passion of mine because mm. often the tacit knowledge around how a service should and could be designed sits with them. They don't always have the freedom and the autonomy, nor the maybe the, even the skills to dream big about what that might look like, um, mostly because they haven't had the autonomy. Um, but I always knew there was something here. And 
We ran a program uh, last year and the year before uh, with the, the like Kelly Chase Foundation in London, who uh, exists to fund initiatives and organisations who support people with complex needs and to really drive, um, I guess, like a more uh, equal society um, and, yeah. and help those organisations develop research and initiatives around that. Um, and so in collaboration with the Point people who led the project, um, we ran a program called Systems Changes. And we ran it with 11 frontline staff members who work in organisations who do support people with complex needs. And when I say complex needs, just for the audience, um, that can mean that you have a variety of things going on in your life. Um, it often makes it very difficult to use services that exist mm -hmm. because of the way that they tend to box people. So if you are homeless and you have a drug addiction issue, you might be just having left prison, you could have relationship issues, you could have one, two, three, four, a whole number of issues that... Um, stop you in your life from uh, living a really fulfilled and, and happy uh, equal life. So we ran this program with the, this group of uh, staff and we taught them uh, some design and service design skills, basics and journey mapping, prototyping. Uh, we taught them about systems thinking, so looking at more uh, ways to map and visually understand uh, politics, cultural barriers, things that exist in a system uh, around the services that they run. Um, and we taught them a lot of um, actually individual things around unconscious bias, um, around how they label people in society. And the results were, were really phenomenal. What um, happened? Yeah. Well, was phenomenal. So quite a lot of them, I call them like uh, hackers of the system. Um, they, one of them created a new product that helps uh, both uh, staff at the front line and people with complex needs uh, navigate the benefit system. Uh, with very uh, simple journey maps so you can understand uh, how many minutes you have on the phone until it cuts out, uh, what to say on the phone at certain points to make sure that you get put through to the next part of the benefits process. Um, and that could be and is hugely vital, I think, for people. So, Sarah, I, th I think a lot of people uh, who are watching or listening this episode can empathize uh, uh, with this, but I think the big difficulty is it's, n it's not really hard to find frontline staff who have ideas about how service can be improved. The real hard part is, I think, uh, creating the context or the conditions in which they are able to execute on that, to make those ideas happen. So why do you think in your example, why did it work? I think it worked because we set up the buy-in in the first place from their senior leaders. So it, anyone it, who... Yeah. Which way? Anyone, what, what did yeah. you do? <laughs> Any, well, anyone who came on the programme, um, we made sure that the senior leaders actually signed off their involvement, mm -hmm. uh, that they were fully understanding of the programme, um, that they were involved at several points throughout. Um, and we taught kind of basic stuff that goes around the design stuff, around mm -hmm. like presentation skills, communication skills, to make sure that those guys could take you know, the things that we're working on back to a board level mm -hmm. and show the value of them. So we had... Um, a few of the staff uh, actually be working uh, because they're in a charity context with their boards um, who then they convinced to sign off new programs of work actually on, on how they should be moving forward. Yeah. Um, and in fact, one guy um, last year uh, created a whole new arm of the organization that he now leads up. Um, so it's for me, it's about, it, as you said, Mark, I think people really understand it's easy to get, it's easy-ish to get ideas from people, but you then need to look at the more uh, the construction of the right vehicles within an organization in which to enable that. And you need to be thinking about that from, from the get-go, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you sort of have to have someone who understands that from a sort of meta, meta level in the organization, I guess, right? Yeah, completely. Or, or, or help that person who is at the front line, and, in some, in, and if I'm if being very stereotyped about this, doesn't have a lot of autonomy to find the people who have the power hmm. to make the changes to allow them to do it. And so whether it's, um, like you said, easy to come up with ideas, but very hard to implement them. So hmm. you've got to really work on helping them understand where and how they can make that idea come to life. And that's actually more of the work than it is the design of the thing that they want to happen. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sarah, our time is uh, flying by. I'm not sure if that's correct English, but anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, it's your opportunity to ask the people who are listening or watching this episode a question. So what is on your mind? What would you like to ask us? 
the community. So I would like to find out if you work inside an organisation and you're using design, how, how are you doing it and what has been the, what's been the commitment or buy-in to that and how are you being measured? Hmm. I'd love to know how you're being measured, particularly on the inside of organisations when it comes to an investment in design. That's really an interesting topic. I have a whole course on <laughs> investing and uh, selling the value of service design. So that's, that's, I'm also interested in that. Go and leave your comments down below. And it's especially for people who are working on the inside, right? Because from the agency consultancy perspective, we sort of get that, but. Yeah, completely. I mean, I think agencies have done a fantastic job of helping build the service design industry really mm. from the get go. Um, and we've become, we have to be really good <laughs> At selling, right? That's our yeah. job, um, yeah. and and building these processes around it. But mm. I'm interested when it gets messy okay. on the inside. Yeah, the the, 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 the evangelists and the pioneers who, who take, uh, you know, for instance, we talked a lot about government. You have to have some sort of a special mentality to start doing service design within our public sector, right? You have to have patience, and that takes that that's a different attitude compared to an agency. Yeah, completely. I think. Um, most people will, will be aware that, that maybe even quite honestly the remuneration in different kind of roles in comparison to government and, and maybe private industry is quite different. So mm. you have to, it's not about money for people, it's really about the commitment to want to make people's lives better. And yeah. I think from my friends and colleagues that work across government, I couldn't speak more highly of, of all of them who are on that, that journey to seeking to do that. Mm. Sarah, um Thanks for your time. Thanks for sharing your ideas, the topics. I think they are super relevant. I hope uh, a lot of people will comment on them and, and watch the episode. So what is your biggest takeaway from this talk with Sarah? Share your thoughts and ideas down below in the comments. And remember, more people like you are watching these episodes and your comment might just be the creative spark someone needed. If you'd like to learn more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to the Service Design Show University at learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we talk about on the show. I'll see you in two weeks time with a brand new episode. Thanks for watching and I'll see you then.